The tricky topic that I'm going to explain is going to be how the kidneys work and more specifically how the kidneys control the volume of water in the blood. First of all, let's think about what the big picture is here and why this is really, really important. So we know that we need water in order for cells to work inside the body. However, we also know that water will move in and out of a cell by osmosis. So we need to control the volume of water in our blood so we don't damage our cells. For example, if I've got a cell and surrounding that cell is a very concentrated solution, so there's lots of solute. For example, there's a lot of glucose around that cell. There's not a lot of water surrounding the cell, there's a lot of glucose. Water will move from inside the cell to outside the cell by a process called osmosis through a partially permeable membrane and that cell will shrivel and it will die. Likewise, if I've got a cell and surrounding that cell I've got lots of water, so I've got a really high volume of water, and inside the cell, compared to outside the cell, I've got lots of glucose, then the opposite will happen. Water will move into that cell via osmosis and this time the cell will burst open and again the cell will die. In both situations the cell is going to die and if you have lots of cells dying your organs will fail and the organism itself will die. So it's really important that we control the amount of water that we have surrounding our cells and the way that we do that, there are three main ways. First of all, we can lose excess water when we sweat. We can also lose excess water when we breathe out. But we can also lose excess water when we urinate. And this is the process that we're going to focus on now. Before we do that, it's worth just pointing out what urine is actually made of. So urine is made up of a mixture of different things. It's made up of some water, it's made up of some mineral ions, some salts like sodium, potassium, chloride, and it's also most importantly made of a waste product called urea. Urea is formed when we have excess, so that's too many proteins in our diet, and too many proteins can lead to a buildup of too many amino acids in our body and that's really dangerous. So what we do is we use our liver, that's the liver here, and the liver breaks down the amino acids into something called urea. First of all it turns it into something called ammonia and ammonia is really toxic so we want to get rid of that so we then really quickly turn that into urea and urea is lost out of the body within the urine. The structures that are involved in this are the urinary system and the urinary system is made up of a few important key parts. First of all we've got the kidneys and we're going to talk about the kidneys in a moment, we're going to talk about the structures and how they function. There are two kidneys and each one is attached to a special tube called a ureter. The ureters both travel down to the bladder so they transfer urine from the kidneys down to the bladder. The bladder stores the urine until it's ready to be excreted and it's excreted out of the urethra. Be really careful that you don't get ureter and urethra mixed up. If we look at the kidneys um, and the urinary system in a little bit more detail and we focus on the kidneys themselves, we'll see that there are two kidneys and each one is attached to two really important blood vessels. We've got a renal artery. The word renal refers to anything linked to the kidneys. And if it's an artery, we might know that it must be going away from the heart. So a renal artery is a blood vessel which is going away from the heart and it's supplying the kidneys with oxygenated blood. They're also attached to a renal vein. Remember, renal refers to anything that's to do with the kidneys and vein is something that is going into the heart. So the renal veins leave the kidneys and they take deoxygenated blood back into the heart. 
If we look at each individual kidney in more detail, we'll see that they are made up of some really important structures called tubules or nephrons. The outer part of the kidney is where you would find the tubules and there are millions of those found within each kidney. It is in the tubules where this control of water levels and the urine is produced. So there are two main things that happen in the kidney tubules. Things that we want are selectively reabsorbed back into the body, into the bloodstream, and things that we want to get rid of, waste, are excreted out to make urine. So we're going to zoom in a little bit and look at what happens at each tubule. So the tubules are surrounded by capillaries. So we have a capillary here, we have a tubule here. Worth noting that anything that is in the tubule by the time you get to the end um, of the tubule is going to be lost as urine. So this is where we have our waste products. This is going to form urine and is going to be lost out of the body. Anything remaining within the capillary is going to stay within the body. So that's going to stay within the bloodstream. So at first, at the very, very top and the very, very beginning of the tubules, the really, really high pressure that we experience up here forces smaller substances to pass through the capillary walls into the tubules. Those substances are urea, water molecules, mineral ions such as sodium, might be chloride and it might also be potassium, and glucose. The larger substances such as proteins they are not small enough to pass through those gaps, so they stay within the blood in the capillaries. Now we don't want all of those substances lost as waste, we want some of those things to be reabsorbed back into the capillaries. So then we have to have a process where we select what we want to reabsorb, so keep in the bloodstream, and what we want to keep as waste and remain in the tubule. First of all, we want all of the glucose to be reabsorbed. And we call this process selective reabsorption because we are selecting particular substances to be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. We want all of the glucose to be selectively reabsorbed because that's going to be used for respiration. If you have any glucose in your urine, it is a sign that your tubules are not working effectively because all of it should be reabsorbed. The second thing are mineral ions, so mineral ions, sodium, potassium, chloride ions. Again, we might want some of those selectively reabsorbed, but we might want to keep some in the tubule and lose that as waste. And that will depend on what the concentrations of those minerals are in the blood already. We want to lose all of the urea. Urea is a waste product, so all of the urea needs to stay within the tubules and it's going to be lost as urine. We also want to selectively reabsorb some of the water. This will depend on the volume of water in the blood already, and I'm going to talk you through how we choose and how we select how much water to reabsorb. So just to summarise then, by the time we get to the end of the tubule where we are um, excreting the urine, we should have some water we should have some mineral ions, we should have all of the urea, and we should have no glucose. So in other words, what is selectively reabsorbed? All of the glucose, some of the water, some of the ions, and no urea. So how do we control what's reabsorbed and what isn't reabsorbed? So the part of the brain, this is actually a gland and it's called the pituitary gland that is responsible for this. We find this in the brain and this gland, the pituitary gland, is in charge of detecting the water levels in the blood and then controlling the selective reabsorption of water in order to, to make sure that we have got the right concentration differences in and outside of our cells so our cells don't shrink or they don't burst. So the pituitary gland is found in the brain. When there is not enough water in the blood, 
so the blood is very concentrated with maybe glucose, um, amino acids, other substances. There is not enough water in the blood. The pituitary gland will detect this and it will release more of a hormone called ADH. That stands for antidiuretic hormone. In order to help you kind of understand what this does, a diuretic is something that makes you urinate more. So an antidiuretic hormone is going to prevent you from urinating quite as much as you were earlier on in order to retain and reabsorb more of that water. So let's just recap. When there is not enough water in the blood, the pituitary gland will detect this and it will release more ADH. The ADH, like all hormones, will travel through the bloodstream and it will travel to the kidney tubules and it acts on the tubules and it makes them more permeable. Permeable means it allows more water to be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. So more water is reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. That means we have more water going across from the tubules into the capillaries. Because of this, we're going to have less water in the urine and the urine is going to become more concentrated and you're going to have a, a lower volume of urine. That means that water is staying in the blood, which is really important for our cells to function. On the other hand, we might have a situation where we have got too high a volume of water in the bloodstream. Again, it's the pituitary gland which will detect this, but this time it releases less ADH, less antidiuretic hormone. If we have less antidiuretic hormone acting on the kidney tubules, it makes them less permeable. It makes them less permeable. So what that means is that here we will have less of this reabsorption of water. More of the water stays in the tubule and goes on to form the urine. That means that our urine will become more dilute and there will be a larger volume of urine. It means that we are not storing too much water in our blood, ve um, blood vessels and that means that the tissue fluid surrounding our cells is not too dilute and we're not going to have um, cells bursting because they're absorbing too much water by osmosis.